Well, I think we're ready. Let's go ahead. Come before our Lord. Let's stand together. Lord, we come into your house tonight, and uh, again, we are blessed to be your children, blessed to be part of your family. Looking forward, Lord, to what you have for us tonight. And we, uh, we ask, Lord, that you would come and inhabit the praises of your people, that you would uh, take joy in what you hear tonight, and that you would bless us. Give us what we need, Lord. We look to you. We serve you only. We pray in your name. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but holy. Solid rock I stand on other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand When darkness fell in a lovely face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy game my anchor holds Solid rock I stand on Heaven around Is sinking sand All heaven around Is sinking sand His oath is covered And his blood Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way foundation. Thank you, Lord. Say hi to somebody. Yeah. 
Father, it's an honor to come into your presence, Lord God. And it's an amazing thing, Lord, that we, as sinners saved by grace, can come and be with the Holy God. Or really, the Holy God can come be with us, Lord. And we thank you for your presence here tonight, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And we want to thank you for the Word of God, Lord. We know the book of Proverbs are jewels, Lord. So, Father, teach us, Lord, those things we need to know. Prepare us for the days that come ahead, Lord God. And, Lord, we need your wisdom. So give us your wisdom. Make our heart attentive, Lord God. And whatever's on your mind, God, whatever's on your heart, Father, speak it to us, Lord, tonight. Work in us now, now, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. Tonight we're in Proverbs chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 16. You know, I really like teaching Proverbs. It's a wonderful book. It's work to learn God's Word. It wasn't too long ago that I went gold hunting and I have a metal winder and I only used it once. I never found any gold. I never found any metals either. But my point is when a man goes for gold he digs and digs and digs and digs. And sometimes he finds a little, but then he gets excited. Have, have any of you heard of gold fever? Gold fever, I've seen it on men, even during these days. It wasn't long ago, I have a friend that he used my uh, metal detector and uh, he found some gold. And now he called, he came and saw me and it wasn't too long ago and he says, I'm buying land. I'm buying land. My uncle has land. I'm buying land. I'm going. I'm. I mean, he's talking. <laughs> he's breathing hard. <laughs> I thought, my gosh. I said, how much have you found in gold so far? And he's been doing it, you know, for like a year, maybe a year and a half. And he goes up every weekend, just about, up to Placerville in that area. And he says, no, I've found at least thirty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I said, $30? I didn't say anything like, I didn't say what I wanted to say. I said, oh, that's good. That's about zero cents an hour. <laughs> but he's enthused about gold. And I personally believe that we need to be enthused about God's word in the sense of Search for it as gold. When I was younger in the Lord, and I have probably 500 commentaries. And I studied and studied and studied. I still do. But the Lord has me back into my commentaries on into the Hebrew and the Greek a lot more. Because I personally believe that what's going to get us through in the days that we live is the Word of God. Earlier today when I was studying, the Lord showed me a picture of a goat. And I believe that God wants us to be goats in a way. I'm not talking about an old goat, because old goats can be a pain in the neck. <laughs> What's a she-goat? A goatee? <laughs> I 
all I'm saying is goats, if you see them climb, they are so sure-footed. When they're little, <coughs> excuse me, when they're little, they begin to climb up at the sides of the hills. And they go up the mountains that are 6,000, 7,000 feet. And they're on the little teeny ledge, this big. And that mountain goes sh straight down. And they are confident and they don't fall. I'm sure that in the history of all goats, they've, some have fallen, I'm sure, but not many. But they are really sure-footed. And I believe that God wants us to be sure-footed, just like those goats, because we're going to be climbing to spaces or spots that we've never been for in our lives. And we have to know and be prepared concerning the Word of God. So I have a question before we go into the Bible tonight. When's the last time you dug into the Word of God? I mean really dug. I'm not talking about just reading. I read my Proverbs every single day, and I read through the Bible every year, and I read through different books in the Bible. And I, I read through them, and God speaks to me sometimes different things. But And I study, so I'm different in the sense of I have to do a lot more studying. Even though I've taught through the book of Proverbs, even though I've taught through many of the books several times, I still have to do a lot more studying. It has to get inside me. And God wants to show me new things and deeper things, things that will make, my, make the Word of God more settled in my heart and in my life. So what I'm, my point is, is this. You can't live on what you ate last week or last month or five years ago. You have to live on what you eat spiritually today and yesterday. The rest is going to be disposed of, so to say, in a way. It's still there, but not the same strength and ability that you need to be given to fresh food constantly. So Proverbs 16 speaks a lot about a lot of different things. As most of the prophets do, they're going to same, change subjects after one verse. But I picked up a couple of, because Proverbs is a lot of wisdom, I picked up a couple of sayings from different people. And I thought, some of these are wise, and some of them aren't, but it, it comes from the world somewhat. And I know it's not, we're not supposed to take the wisdom of the world, but I believe that some of them can be useful as long as they don't contradict the Word of God. Let me give you a few. None are so brave as the anonymous. You, you find that to be true? I do. Here's another one. They always say time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself. That's true also. I believe. Here's another one. Experience is not what happens to you. It's what you do with it that happens to you. And the last one is by Henry Ford, the car man. Thinking is a work there is which the probable reason why so few engage in it. So in other words, thinking is hard, and so a lot of people don't want to deal with it in the sense of thinking, or having to think. Now, I want to remind you, the book of Proverbs is wisdom. It gives you wisdom. What it does is it, wisdom, it shows you how to apply knowledge to your life into an area that maybe God is working, or maybe into another person's life, or into your children's life. You can't give what you haven't been given. And God wants to give you wisdom so you can give it to others and help others in their life. 
So let's start on the very first verse. And I stayed in this verse for one hour today because it just wouldn't click. I hate it when it does that. It's supposed to all just flow. The Holy Spirit is supposed to show me everything right away instantly. But it doesn't work like that. So it says in verse 1, The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So this preparation, it has three parts to it. Man's purposes, it can mean man's schemes, and then man's thinking or thoughts. So man does a lot of thinking, and that's what we, have to, we want to touch on real quickly. And I thought that what we should do concerning our thinking and how we should approach our thinking is to think before you do something. Think of its effects. A lot of times people do not think, and I'm one of them, I, in age, have become a, become a lot slow thinker in the sense of I think slower on purpose so I won't speak quicker out of foolishness. When I think, I think how it's going to affect those that listen to me or hear what I'm saying. Probably one of the greatest influences that any one of us have are on our children when they grow up or when they're adults or on our grandchildren. And the things we say to them in our, from our thinking are going to affect our lives for good or for bad. Let's stay on the subject of thinking again a little bit more. In thinking, I think what we need to do is think what we say, what it will do to me and what it will do for others. In our thinking, we need to think of what is going to be the consequence of what we say or what we do. Is it going to be a consequence of good, or is it going to be a consequence of bad? Many times we do not think before we act. <laughs> Did you guys hear that too? <laughs> Man, I thought I was inside a, a drum. And the second part is, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. In other words, God gives wisdom, and God wants to answer. God wants to give us the right answer. Let me read to you a different tra translation for that verse. We can gather our thoughts, but the Lord will give the right answer. I have found it to be true, and again, I'm coming to the Bible, or going to the Bible. When I need an answer, I go to God's Word, and I read God's Word, and I ask God to speak to me somewhere or another through the Scripture. And because I've stored up God's Word in my heart for so many years, it's all there, just about, I think. And there's more that God needs to put in, without a doubt. It can come back to me in the sense of the Lord by the Holy Spirit can bring it to remembrance of what I need. I can't tell you how many times I've asked God different questions, given, asking Him to give me wisdom on making a decision that God has brought the Scripture to my remembrance. Now, every one of you as a Christian, every one of you as a Christian, this has happened to you. It has to. As the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God has the right answer. But I found it to be true also. I have to make sure that I have the right heart. God, do I really want to hear what you have to say? You've all heard me tell that story of the lady who went to the Y 
And she kept on throwing the stick up, but which road to go, on the left or the right? And the man found her. She had been throwing the stick up for about a half an hour. And she said to the lady, why are you throwing that stick up? She said, because it keeps on going to that road, and I don't want to go to that road. I want to go this road. And so until it goes that way, I'm not going to stop throwing that stick up. Now, look at the second one. All the ways of a man are pure, are clean, are faultless in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirit. So in this Hebrew word, ways, is the course of life. In other words, in the natural man, my course of life, the choices I make, are clean and pure in my own mind, and it can be in my own heart even. I have found it to be true that you and I can justify anything we do. Anything we do, we can justify it. Well, here's why I did it. This is why I did this. This is why I said this, even though it's wrong. Even though, as the second part says, but the Lord weighs the spirit. And it says for the motive, why do I do what I do? Let me say this to you tonight. We as a Christians need to check out our motives, why we do what we do do, or why we continue to do them. Because a lot of the times we can drift from where we were at one time, our hearts were set in stone, and we can drift away from that place. And that's why the Bible says, or one of the reasons why the Bible says in Proverbs, that we are to guard our hearts. Out of them flow the, all the issues of life, and our hearts move sometimes. And God needs to move them back, and we need to let God move them back, and we need to do our part in moving them back to where they need to be. Why, and let me ask a question to you tonight, why do you do what you do? Why do I get in this pulpit on Sunday and Wednesday and teach? I have to make sure my heart is right while I do it. Why do I say what I say? Why do I help that person why am I kind? And literally, the bottom line should be because I love God. Because I want to please God. No other motive. And if my motive is wrong, after I've checked it, then I need to ask God, then help me change that motive, God. I don't want to do it for that reason. I want it to do it the way you want me to do it. You'll be amazed what that will do in your relationship with God. I want to read this word motive. And this is just Webster's. The intention, what, could, what a person, or what causes a person to do something or act in a certain way. I personally believe that God wants us to be real. What you see is what you get. That's how it should be. Not pretend. Not an imposter, but who you are. That doesn't mean that you have to be... <laughs> I don't want to see your flesh, put it that way. And you don't want to see my flesh. Because that's all ugly. That's how it is. But what you want to see is that man or that woman that loves God and walked with, him, with God and that man or woman who's filled with God's spirit, who love comes out of them, God's love. And God's love only. Let me say this to you. And I've experienced this. God judges our movement, motive. And God tries our motive at times. God will say, okay, well, this is what I want you to do. But I'm going to show you your motive, why you're doing this. Or why you're not doing it. It's not just doing, it's sometimes not doing. 
I would do it, but I'm just not going to do it because, because why? Because your motive is wrong. I have a problem with that person. I don't have a problem with anybody in here. I'm not talking about me personally. Let me read you this little commentary. Now, no matter what a guy does, it's right. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. You can justify everything you've done or so full of excuses. I did it because even if it's wrong, we got a good reason or at least a good excuse. Of course, Benjamin Franklin said that the man who is good with excuses is seldom good for anything else. The way of a man are clean in his own eyes, but God weighs his spirits. Now God knows the motive. God knows why I did it, the motive behind it, and that's what is important. Now let's go to verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Now the Bible says literally the labors are what you're doing concerning laboring or what maybe God has called you to personally do. And he tells us to commit them to God. The word literally means to roll over. So it could be, and this is my, uh, my understanding of it, of a whale surfacing, swimming on top, and then flipping over and rolling everything off. Now, that's exactly what God wants us to do. He wants us to roll over our works to Him, to commit them to Him. What I'm doing, God, is up to you. And then when we do that, the Bible says our thoughts will be established. They'll be directed or right by God. If we'll do that, we're able to leave the results up to God. I commit my children to God every single day. I roll them up. I commit my grandchildren. I quit, commit the ministry to God and what's up to Him. And then I'm okay with my thinking. That's how it works. It's up to God what He does. I can't push God. I can't make God do certain things. I want you to do this, God. I can't do that. It's going to frustrate the daylights out of me. But I can commit them to God, and God will take them. And then my thoughts will be established by God. Verse 4. Here's something that we need to remember every day of our life. The Lord has made all for himself. Yes, even for the wicked for the day of doom. So, in the book of Revelations, chapter 4, where they strangle all the little birds, whether they're phones or whether they're real. In the book of Revelation, it says that we were created for God's good pleasure. God created all things, so everything belongs to God. Now, I may not like that. That doesn't change the truth. You see, we were made to have fellowship with God, to have a relationship with God. That's why we were created. And we were made to please God. That's how you were made. If you get out of that place in your thinking and your choices, what happens is you won't become fulfilled, you'll become dissatisfied, and you'll be empty inside. 
But what if I do decide to do this? My life becomes complete. There is no happier man and woman or no more complete or content man or woman in the world than a Christian who walks in the Spirit of God. There isn't one. There is no man that or woman more successful in succeeding in the will of God when they allow God to be their life. There isn't one. And it may not be success in a man's eyes or what man calls successful in being wealthy and having position and having possessions. Not that those are bad. But before God's eyes and for, before our Heavenly Father, that is where we need to be. I'm going to read it again to you. The Lord has made all things for himself. And that includes me. Verse 5. In the book of Proverbs, you're going to read a lot of this, so these same thoughts. And there's a reason for them. Let me share with you in a minute. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Now they join forces, forces, none will go unpunished. So the first part of this verse says, every one proud in heart is an abomination. In other words, it disgusts God. Pride disgusts God. He hates it. He doesn't hate the person that's full of pride. But he hates what pride does to a person. How it makes them. You know, when we... If you've ever seen somebody who's been on drugs, there was a man here a lot yesterday who was eating, eating the, at the meals. He couldn't go in. He said, I, I can't go in. I can't go in. Can I, I, would you get me some water? I said, yeah, I'll get you a bottle of water. So I went and got him a bottle of water. And I said, what's wrong? He goes, I just can't go inside. I just can't go inside. And he's doing this. And it's taken over. His drugs are taken over. He's got tattoos all over his body. He's got them on his face. He's got some on his arms. He, he's just something different. It's like something that you'd see in the, uh, the gangs. But it's not him. And he was a young guy. He was probably in his 20s. He was probably a good-looking guy one time, he, maybe an athlete. But what happened to him, drugs took over and is destroying him and killing him. It's affecting him. And you and I can see that. And it's a sad situation. But pride is exactly the same thing. It does different things to you. I like what one man said about pride, because I believe it's true. A man who's proud or a woman who's proud has not seen God. Let me tell you why. Because in, when a man sees God, he has to humble himself. You cannot come to Christ without being humble. The Bible teaches that a proud man imitates Satan in his repel, proud rebellion against God. Now let me read this word to you just to remind you of what it means. Probably should have done it at the beginning. Proud in heart or haughty. Unduly high opinion of oneself, exaggerated. Self-esteem. Conceit. Haughty, arrogance. All these are an abomination to God. God hates them. Let's go to the next one. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of of the Lord, one departs from evil. So we see that mercy, which is not getting what you deserve, and truth, we all know what truth is, 
atonement is provided for. And that can be a picture of Christ, him being merciful and bringing forth truth that we are sinners and accepting Christ. It brings us to repentance. But God also wants us to use this tool when we meet people who do not, do not know God. When I met that young man, I, had, I think I'd seen him one time before. But I felt bad for him. And I could have said, you know, you have a serious problem with drugs, buddy. I don't think it would have made him shocked. Oh, really? But there's probably been times in my life that I felt like that. And I wanted to say something like that, and maybe I even did. And God kind of talked to me about being mer merciful as he is merciful, and being truthful as he is truthful. So we have to mix them together when we come to someone that is in a place of where they need to come to God, whether it be to accept Christ or to come back to God from repentance. And the thought comes to mind that is how would I want to be brought back to God? With mercy and truth or with fire and brimstone? And then it says in the second half of this, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. In the Chronicles of Narnia, an allegory by C.S. Lewis, the author has two girls, Susan and Lucy, getting ready to meet Ashlyn, the lion, who represents Christ. Two talking animals, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, prepares the children for the encounter. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. He is quite safe. I shall feel rather nervous about meeting the lion. That you will, dearie, said the beaver. And make no mistake, if there is anyone who can appear before Ashton without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then it isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe? said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good and he is a king, I will tell you. One of the things that I learned before becoming a Christian was a fear of God. It's not that I had it down pat. I still don't have it down pat. But I learned a reverence for God. I learned that when I came to church, and that's where I learned it, that you didn't disrespect in any way. And it was a bad thing, too. Not just good. Good came, came from it. But bad came from it also. Because I felt like God was there, and God was everywhere. But when we come to God's house, there's a special reverence, I believe, that we're to have in the sense of, I'm come here to meet God. That doesn't mean I don't have fellowship with other Christians. That doesn't mean that I don't rejoice and I don't laugh. It doesn't mean any of those things. But it means I have a holy reverence for a holy God. And the one that I'm meeting with is nobody to mess around with. And my dad, when I went to see my dad, I always had a reverence for my dad because I feared him. How much more about God? Well, we can enter into God. God has a different relationship with it. No, he doesn't. Not with that. I can go to God as my father, and he loves me. He'll speak to me. He'll correct me. He'll caress me. We'll have intimacy. God can do all those things, and he does. One of the things that God desires and requires is a holy fear of him. Because that's what the Bible teaches partly. Causes one to really repent or depart from evil. Now, verse 7. 
When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes, all his, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. So, in other words, God wants us to please him. In the way that we live, that's what the ways mean, the way of life, how I treat other people, how I act, how I deal with things rightfully, that's what the Bible teaches. And when we do that, the Bible says, my ways please God. I think one of the strongest points for a Christian concerning their relationship with God is we want to please him. But it isn't a pleasing because God's going to bless me or because if not, I don't please God, then God's going to strike me dead. It isn't that kind. Children, I think we need to learn from. Children want to please you. My grandkids, the little ones, want to please me every time I see them. And it isn't because they're afraid of me. It means it's because they love me. And it's the same thing with God. So if you want to please God, you please God in the ways that you live, the way you treat your husband, the way you treat your wife, the way you treat your children, the way you do things in life every day, the way you act, the way you speak. But listen to what it says here, the second part of this. He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. In other words, it's possible for us to please the Lord in our life that would cause others we would have peace with. You're going to always have enemies. And I don't believe that the scripture is teaching here that God is going to get rid of all your enemies because Jesus had enemies and he couldn't have pleased God the Father any more than anyone. He did it more than anyone, period. But he had the Pharisees and he had a lot of enemies still. But as we walk with God and we please God, our enemies will begin to become less. I believe that's what the Bible is teaching. Verse 8, better is a little with righteousness than vast revenue without justice. Better is a holy life with just dealings, getting it fairly and right, working for it. The Bible teaches it's better to have a little than to have all these riches that have been gotten illegally or wrong. They say that since the pot went for sale and became legalized, there have been thousands of more millionaires and billionaires since that selling the pot. I know of some my own self who become multimillionaires on the, at the expense of other people. To me, that's unjust, ill-gotten gain. Verse 9. There's a good scripture here. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Let me read you a different uh, translation. A person may think of plans, of plans, but the Lord decides what he will do. Here's it in a nutshell. Man proposes, God disposes. So is it wrong to make plans? I believe that plans are a good thing, but ultimately, what happens is up to God. In other words, I believe that we have to be flexible. I can't tell you how many times that God has changed my plans. This weekend, I'm going away to be with my children and grandchildren, and my wife's taking me with her. But if God was to say, and he's done that before, I don't want you going away. I won't go away. That's just how it works.
It's one thing to make a plan, or our plans, but it's another to submit and plan to the plans that God ultimately makes for us. Verse 10. Divination is on the lips of the king. His mouth must not transgress in judgment. So what he's talking about literally is a king who makes decisions. Divination is literally talking about being led by God. King David was led by God, and so divination was on his lips. He spoke judgment right. But the second part, it says, his mouth must not transgress in judgment. In other words, he must bring sound judgment. You know, it, it's hard to look at our justice system today, isn't it? I think probably we live in, as a nation, the most unjust times of our history. And I believe that the lawlessness that you see now is going to increase, not because I think personally, but God says it in the Bible, in the Word of God, in the last days that lawlessness will abound, and we see it. Verse 11. Honest weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his works. So the God gives the illustration about he himself have made scales. You know, you've seen the scales where you put balance on half, put so much on this side, say a pound of bread, and you put another pound of something here, and it weighs it, that way it's balanced, and you deal fairly with everything. God made that for a reason, because he wants man to be fair with each other in every area of life. God sets us up on purpose. God wants us to deal fairly in business, because it's pleasing to God. Now, how many of you ever went to a garage sale and you look at something and you say, man, they only want this much for it. That's pretty good. But I see if I can get them down. I used to say Jew them down, but I don't say that anymore. I say Luhan down. <laughs> but there are times that I've done that and the Lord says, no. You need to give the price that they're asking. Don't try to bring them lower than that. You're getting a good deal. But I'll tell you, in my flesh, it's like, I can get a better deal. <laughs> it is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. So it's talking about people in authority who commit wickedness. And I hate to say this, but this is our nation today. It's so sad. You never want to say things like that in the sense of a country that you love. And I love America. I would never want to be in, other, in any other nation, in any other place besides America. I would not want to put my roots down in any other nation. And I love California, and I'm sure you do too, and that's good. And if you love another state, that's okay too. It's all America. But it's sad to see the leaders of our nation becoming so wicked, so evil in the decisions they're making, so corrupt. And they're finding out every day more and more how corrupt we are as a nation. And how can God bless a nation like that? He can't. We are crumbling from inside because of wickedness and evil. And God says it's an abomination for leaders, kings, to commit wickedness or a throne, or really, I would say, and I put these are my words, a nation is established by righteousness, what is right before God. Verse 13, righteousness, a righteous lips are a delight of a king. And they that love him speak what is right. You 
Now, is it always easy to speak what is right to somebody in authority? Not really. It's hard. Sometimes you don't want to even tell your kids things because it's hard to tell them. But the Bible says, love always does what's best for the person that's loved. Verse 14. As messengers of death is a king's wrath, but a wise man appeals or pacifies it. In other words, he doesn't provoke somebody in power like that that can take his life. In the light of the king's face is life, our blessings, he's saying. And his favor is like the cloud of the latter rain. The latter rain was the last rains that came in at the end of April and May, and it would bring a huge harvest. And that's what this king's favor is like. Verse 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. So I have a question for you this, this evening. What would you rather have, wisdom? If God was to say to you like he did to Solomon, Solomon, what do you ask of me? What do you want? And he asked God for wisdom. God, give me wisdom that I may lead these people for there are many and I'm not wise. What if God was to ask you that same question? Because there's going to be times in your life that God is going to ask you questions similar to that. What is it you want? I want to remind you of something. The streets of gold in heaven are paved with gold. So it's not worth much, really, if it's that many streets. But wisdom is needed today because if you have wisdom and you use it rightly, it'll add life to you, the inward man, and it'll add life to others. He who keeps his way preserves his own soul. That, that's not it. To get understanding. So, look at me, and how many of you believe, have, believe that you have understanding? That you understand about what life is about, and you understand what others feel like, or you understand what others are going through. Or you put yourself in the place where other people are, That's understanding. And God wants us to have understanding. God says, and get understanding more than silver, more than riches. He goes on, he says in verse 17, the highway of the upright is apart from evil. But he who guards or keeps his way preserves his soul. Matthew Henry says this, keep the way and God will keep thee. Keep to the way and God will keep you. Verse 18 Here's another one that you probably enjoy. Pride goes before destruction. No, that's not how it goes. Pride goes before a fall and, and the Holy Spirit before destruction, right? That's how it usually goes. But it goes like this in the scripture. Pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before a fall. Let me read this word to you in the Hebrew because I think it's important. It, it bears a lot more fruit and it gives you a lot more understanding. Destruction, breaking or fracture. How many of you have ever had a broken bone? Raise your hand. Do you like it? And how long does it take to heal? Too long. Too long. And that's what pride brings. Crushing, the word means crushing or crash to ruin, shattering, 
are crushing. The Chinese say, he who flies not high falls not low. Pride sought flight in heaven, fell to hell. So God makes a promise and we probably all have been or had this happen in our lives that if we get haughty or we get proud we're going to fall no matter what. Probably the greatest men in the Old Testament in the sense of the world, not spiritually, but the world was Nebuchadnezzar. Great man, wise man, built things that we can't build today. Intellectual, fearless, and all those things drove him to pride. And he fell for seven years, the Bible teaches, seven seasons. And during those seven seasons, he went cuckoo. He went crazy. And God warned him, and he warned him, and he warned him, and he wouldn't listen. So I say this to you tonight. God may be warning you. And let me say this. Pride doesn't mean that you have to be smart. There are poor people who are proud. So it, it, it comes in to every single person. The Bible teaches us, let's go to the next verse. Better to be humble with the lowly and meek than to divide the spoil with the proud. So here's one of the words that God wants us to cherish and keep and grow in every day, I believe, is being humble or lowly. You probably have noticed lately, going through Proverbs, that God speaks a lot about humility. Why does God do that? Because there's so many more blessings that God can bestow on a man or a woman that's humble, a child that's humble. There's so many ways that God can use a person like that and greatly when their hearts are in the place of knowing that they can't do it or they don't have the strength or the ability to do it. The Bible teaches us about Paul. I think Paul is probably the greatest apostle in the, in the New Testament. And God made the statement that why he kept that stake in his flesh, so he would be kept humble. My prayer, and I've shared this with you a few months ago, to God every day is to keep me humble and broken and contrite before him. And help me, Lord, to do my part concerning that Verse 20, he who heeds the word, and we're talking about the Bible there, the word of God, wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. So the Bible teaches here, he who heeds or listens to or applies or lives, the word of God will find good. Is there anything in the Bible of an area in your life that you, it's not in there? Is there anything in the Bible that you, that would hinder you from making a choice for good? I haven't found one yet. Dan, have you found one yet? Pastor Ken, have you found one yet? I don't know of anybody who has found one yet. Todd, have you found one yet? There's not.
But I have to heed the word wisely so the good will come from it as I apply it. And whoever trusts in the Lord is happy. So God wants us to trust him. I shared this not long ago because I think it's important. Because God's been working this in my heart and I believe he's working it in your heart and every one of you today. And that is a, a full faith, a full trusting in God. Let me share a little bit more concerning that same thought. Confidence in the truth and the promises of God, that's trusting God. How confident are you in this? Most of the time, when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is my wife has a cup of coffee waiting for me. I get out and I open up my laptop. And what I do is I'll see a little bit on the news for a few minutes, see what there is. That's it. I skim through it. It takes me about five minutes. Then I go to prophecy and uh, I go to a different web page and I begin to look at the news articles on prophecy. And I'll read them. Sometimes I'll read four or five of them and I'll read them aloud to my wife as she's piddling around the kitchen. And then I'll compare them by the word of God to make sure that what they say is true because I know that this is truth and I know the promises of God are in here. When something difficult happens in your life, what do you do? Do you go to the word of God and say, God, you've made me promises. I use this one Sunday in second, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know, and I can't tell you how many times that has helped me to trust God, that all things work together for good for them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things are working together for good. There are four ordained by God. So God wants me to have confidence in the truth and in the promises. That's part of trusting God. Part of trusting God is also depending on God's strength and not on my own. Look at me. You are weak people. And so am I. <laughs> All of us are. If everyone would be able to look inside your heart right now, or whatever, all the things that you went through today, the doubts or whatever it may be, every one of us will say, no, don't look. Close the window. Amen? We're weak. God knows that. And really, only weak men really who know themselves and are honest with themselves will go to God for strength. I need your strength, God. But it's not only when times are hard, it's when regular times happen in our lives, when things are going good. I still need God's strength. Do you know when things are going good and I get up in the morning, I feel good and everything, I still put the armor of God on. I don't say, you know, I don't need that today. Yeah, I'm feeling good today. I don't do that. I know what I need every day. So we need to depend on God's strength and not our own. That's part of trusting God. I need to also know that God has this, a strong grip on me. God's hand is upon my life and God's hand is upon your life. I can trust him. His hand is one that I've seen many times happen and so have you. And then trusting God, I have to make sure that I keep my eyes on Jesus. Most of you know the story, if not all of you, that Peter had his eyes on Jesus when he was in the boat and he walked on water. And many of you have walked on water. I've seen you. But something happens to us sometimes when we walk on water. <laughs> we start looking at the waves and we start looking to the left and to the right. And then what happens to us is the same thing happens to Peter. We begin to think, sink in our faith. We begin to lose our trust in God. And we need to do just like Peter when he cried out to Jesus, Lord, help. And the Lord helped him run away. But this is part of learning to trust God. 
Whoever trusts in the Lord, the happy is he. Really, your whole relationship has to do with trusting God. God has blessings for you. That's what the word happy means, bless. Verse 21, the wise in heart, those who have, and this is my, my words, those who have solid wisdom will be part called prudent or discerners are one of understanding. And the sweetness of the lips increases learning. In other words, the way that somebody presents something can be sweet and accepted, or it can be sour and rejected. Verse 22, and I'm going to go a little quicker. We're almost done. Understanding is a wellspring of life to him who has it. But the correction of fools is his folly. Let me give you a different translation. Discretion is a life-given foundation to those who possess it. But discipline is wasted on fools. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Now, is that a hard one? Is that easy? It's not easy to teach your lips to say certain things or not to say certain things. Because remember what comes from the lips comes from the heart. And the Bible teaches, it literally says, a wise man teaches his mouth. He doesn't say a lot. I'm not going to say anything. I can't tell you how many times I've had to shut my mouth. I want to say something, and the Lord says, don't say nothing. But I need to say something, Lord. Don't say nothing. So I have to teach my mouth to shut up at times. Now, how many of you have ever had that problem? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so that's the scripture for you tonight, for, most of, for all of us. Teach your mouth. Pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Kind words is talking about there. Gentle words are pleasant to one's soul, the inner man. And there is a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in the way of death. This word right literally means to have a straight path. They see our path down the middle of the aisle right here? It says there's a way that seems straight. In other words, the path I'm taking in my life right now is straight. It's exactly the way I should take it. I shouldn't change anything. Everything is just perfect. I know what I'm doing. Get out of the way. I'm going down this straight road. And here's what God says. But it ends in a way of death. We want to make sure that our shepherd is guiding us and leading us as a sheep down the path he wants to take us. I think 20, Psalm 23 helps us a lot. This came from a commentary on the same thought. There's a way that seems right, the way of life, the philosophy of life that a man has chosen. It seems to be right. Eat, drink, marry. Tomorrow we die. And you talk to the guy and he's convinced that his philosophy is correct. But the end thereof is a way of death. The person, verse 26, who labors, labors for himself, for his hungry mouth drives him on. We read that and we explained that in the chapters we had before this. Verse 27, an ungodly man. I'm going to repeat that because I want to emphasize it. An ungodly man, an ungodly woman digs up evil. And it's talked about that same word, like a shovel going down and digging a hole, digs it up, finds it, hunts for it, goes on the internet and makes sure, you know, seeing what this person's doing, how they're acting, and literally digs it up. Or his hungry mouth drives him. That's not it. An ungodly man digs up evil, and on his lips is like a burning fire. In other words, he wants to spread it. He wants to injure 
others with those words. That's sad, isn't it? When you see the destruction that a person can bring. But the Bible says he's an ungodly man. He's an ungodly woman. People who do that are ungodly. I don't care what they think. God says this is the truth of it. I, w I don't want to know about people's feelings. I mean, if they need help, I want to know. If they want me to pray or something. But I don't want to know about people's feelings and how they fell and this and did this and doing that. And I don't want to know. Because I want to see him in the eyes of Christ, not in the eyes of gossip or lies or deceptions. This word ungodly means worthless. And let me tell you what the meaning of it is. is he's called a, a man of Belial, a man of the devil who digs up things like this. A perverse, perverse man. Verse 28, so strive, our scatters strive. And a whisper separates the best of friends. Now, that, that means it can be double. A whisper can separate two friends. If I say something about you and you're my friend, or a whisper can separate people that are two, or two other friends by saying something to one of the others. A whisperer is a murmurer, a complainer, a backbiter, a tail bearer. That's what the Hebrew means. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. He winks his eyes and devises perverse things. He purses with his lips and brings about evil. This is a lawless man who tempts his friends. Verse 31. We got a couple more and we're done. Two more verses. A silver-haired head. We'll skip this one. <laughs> a silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it's found in the way of righteousness. So in other words, just because you have gray hair, it doesn't mean that you're right. Just if you have gray hair and you live in righteousness, if your life reflects Christ. And the Bible says, it is a crown of glory. Just because a person has gray hair doesn't mean that they are wise and righteous. There's a lot of dirty old men. And there's a lot of dirty old women. And God never wants us to be that way. As we get older, we get, we're supposed to get wiser. But it doesn't come just because you get older and you get gray hair, you get wisdom. It's seeking God and doing what is right before God. Two more verses. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit and he who takes a city. This Hebrew word, slow to anger, means conquers oneself. So how good are you at conquering yourself? Because this is what it's talking about. The one who rules or have dominion or reigns or conquers oneself or conquers his spirit. Within us, there are times we want to get upset and we want to get angry. But the Bible teaches us to be slow to anger and to rule our spirits. No, I'm not letting you do that. I'm not doing that. No, I'm not. And there's a battle that goes on sometimes. Amen? Amen. Doesn't it? No, I'm not going to say that. Leave me alone. You, you probably think sometimes, at least that's how I think sometimes, I think I'm going a little cuckoo here. We're having a little bit of an argument with me, the guy inside me. And that's what happens. But the Bible teaches, teaches in the scripture that he who rules his spirit is better than the one who takes the city than captures this big city. And when's the last time you captured yourself? Hopefully today. Last verse says, the lot is cast into the lap, into the lap but in every decision is from the Lord. 
are really, the real direction comes from God. So I want to say this to you and end this with this thought. There's no such thing as luck. Man, was I lucky. I said that before I was a Christian many times. Man, was I lucky. I can't believe that. I was so lucky. There is no such thing as perchance. Well, that just happened by perchance. According to what the scriptures teaches us, God makes every decision, but his decision is, every, is from the Lord. The lot was something that you threw dice. I was going to bring some dice here with you, but I thought, no, nah, they might want to gamble. So I said, I better leave it at home. <laughs> but that's how they used to do it, dice. Or they would pull straws. Or they would have a black and a white stone. And one would be a yes, the white stone, or the black stone, and one would be a no. And they'd pull it out of their pocket. They'd go in and take one out. That's how they did it. But the Bible teaches that every decision is from the Lord. In other words, God directs, and it comes from God. It's nice to know that, but I want to end it with this thought. That only happens as you submit and surrender yourself wholly to God. If you think you're out there doing your own thing and living in the flesh and saying, you know, God's in control, God's happy, you're fooling yourself. God requires, in order for his will to be done for us, to surrender to it, to yield to it. You know, a good scripture is in Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, concerning that thought. Let me see if I can quote it. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a holy sacrifice unto God. And be not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is the perfect and acceptable will of God. I think I quoted it almost pervadum. Might have missed a word. But that's what God wants from us. Surrender. And when you surrender, God's will will happen in your life. It won't be an accident. It'll be God's will. Father, we are grateful for the word of God. We are grateful for your wisdom, God. And I know that you spoke to every heart tonight something, God. May they grab that seed of the word of God by faith in you. And may they be, that word be planted deep within their hearts, God. And it may it produce the fruit that you sent it for, Lord. You say your word will not come back void, but it will go forth and produce what you call it to produce, Lord God. So, Father, may the word produce in us, Lord, wisdom, Father, understanding, knowledge, God, of the Holy One. Thank you for your blessing on the word of God tonight, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Any